Hello and welcome to our Bernina Embroidery Software webinar, The Ins and Outs of Lettering. I'm Julie Bridgman. I'm your host today. If you have any questions during the webinar, please put them in the questions pane. I will save those for the end of the presentation. Also, if you have audio or visual issues, uh, the best thing to do is to exit the webinar and then log back in. 99% of the time, it's a connection issue on your side. Uh, as far as handouts, we do have five handouts today, and they are located in your handouts pane, which is in your control panel. Go ahead and click on those, and they should download on your computer so you can print them out. Um, but uh, if you do not have time to, we will have the recording and the handouts available to you. Uh, give us a couple days to get all that together and we'll have it on our website on Bernina.com. Our presenter today is Debbie Lashbrook. She is the Bernina, Bernina Embroidery Software Specialist. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you, Julie, and welcome everyone. As Julie mentioned, today's topic is ins and outs of lettering. And if you wish to put in a request for next year's webinars, I am collecting ideas for next year. So you can enter that in the chat box and then Julie will see that I get that information. I would rather present something that you're interested in. So these suggestions really do help. Now today we're going to be talking about different methods for generating lettering in the software and we will review ways that we can edit our embroidered lettering once it's generated. I also want to focus on editing true type fonts because there are some particular things that must be done with true type fonts. And then the rest of the lesson is going to be focused on creating your own style of lettering using different methods. When we generate lettering, we of course have the lettering icon in the digitized toolbox. And with this, we can either generate embroidery fonts or true type fonts. And I'll be talking about the differences a little bit later. We also can go to Artwork Canvas, which is the Corel side of the software, and through the vector lettering icon, we can access our true type fonts and also generate lettering in that way. We also have the possibility of downloading new fonts from different font websites and installing them on our computer, and then we can access those through true type fonts as well. And then, of course, you can create your own lettering by digitizing your lettering. So for the basic information about lettering, if you are brand new to the software or just beginning in the software, I would suggest that you go to the website, Bernina.com, and click on Learn and Create and download the Mastery Workbooks. There are workbooks for software. There are actually four different workbooks for software, and there are machine mastery um, handouts that you can download as well. Now for the software, workbook one includes three lettering lessons, and these will cover the basics of lettering. I'm gonna talk about some of the basic things, but I'll also go into some more advanced things today. So there's a handout on lettering basics that you see pictured here. There's also one on lettering baselines, and there's a handout on true type fonts. And all those are located in the mastery, which you can download from the website. So when we look at object properties for lettering, all these different things can be changed through object properties. We can select the type of font by clicking on the drop down arrow. And the first part of the fonts, there are 99 embroidered fonts. And thereafter, you see all of your true type fonts that have been installed on your computer and you have access to those. Then you can change the size of the lettering you can change the width, and the width is done as a percentage of the height. You can place a slant to the lettering by entering the number of degrees in the italic uh, box, and then you can change the letter spacing. 
You can also change the justification for lines of lettering, and you can change the baseline. If you click on select character, there are also other characters that can be added in addition to any type of letters. So when you click on the font type, the first, like I said, 99 fonts are listed, and these are embroidered fonts, and then all your true type fonts are going to be listed at the end. To access vector lettering, you would have to switch to Artwork Canvas, which is the icon in the upper left corner, and then you click on the vector lettering icon, and when you click on the drop-down box, only true type fonts are shown. Embroidery fonts are not included in this drop-down list. Now, when we look at the difference between embroidered fonts and true type fonts, this first one is embroidered lettering. This was created with a font in the software, and it was an embroidered font. You are always going to get a better stitch out with embroidered fonts for a couple of reasons. For one, uh, one reason, the font has been digitized professionally by a digitizer, and you'll find that all the satin stitches are very smooth. They're smooth transformation from one letter to the next letter. And then with um, embroidered fonts as well, the fonts are digitized with the push-pull in mind. And by push-pull, when you, when you embroider a satin stitch on letter uh, on fabric, for example, the columns tend to pull or push, uh, pull in, and the ends of the column push out. So you've got this push pull going on that can distort your lettering. And when a font is digitized, the digitizer knows about this and will adjust the font accordingly. With true type fonts and vector lettering, it's more of uh, looking at an, a piece of artwork and then adding stitches to that artwork. So it's very similar to the automatic digitizing tools. And sometimes this is just not interpreted as nicely as an embroidered font that has been digitized. We'll be talking a little bit how to correct some of those things a little bit later. Now you should always check your reference manual for the size of fonts and you access the reference manual by going to help and reference manual and then in the appendices you have a listing of all your fonts and it gives you recommended minimums and maximums for each font. Now this is important especially when you decrease the size of the font Sometimes by decreasing the size of the font, you're going to have underlay that pokes out of the lettering. Other times you may have a letter that totally disappears in a word because you've gone beyond the minimum size. With maximum size, the uh, maximum size is determined by the satin stitch width that would, um, would be accepted acceptable. If you go beyond that point, sometimes the satin width is so wide that it will cause um, jump stitches and the uh, floats will be too long and they will snag. Now you can add italics in object properties, but you can also add it visually through the reshape mode. And when you click on reshape, there are diamond control points at the center of each letter. You select the letter that you want, and then you can use the control in the upper left corner, like you see on the slides, to either slant the letter to the left or to the right. The advantage of doing it through reshape is that it allows you to add italics only to certain letters, whereas if you add it to a word in the object properties dialog box, it's going to slant every single letter as you see here in the top part of the uh, word. Now, you can also change the spacing of lettering. And again, you can adjust that through object properties, but when you adjust the lettering spacing in object properties, it 
applies that same spacing in between each letter of the word. If you do it through reshape, you can actually select each individual letter and then click and drag the letter either to the left or the right, and you will influence the spacing only between the two letters that, um, or the one letter that you move and then the other letter, of course, that it's moved toward. So reshaping will give you a little bit more control of the spacing and you can actually move individual letters in this manner. Then with justification, this is for lines of lettering. So you have to have two or more words in order to justify letters. You can justify to the left, as you see here in this first example. You can justify to the right, or you can do center justification, where the lettering is aligned vertically. Full justification really isn't appropriate for these particular words, because what full justification does is takes the widest letter and then adjusts or I should say the widest word, and then adjust the letters of each of the other words that full extent. And so with a short, with a very short word and a very long word, full justification really doesn't work well. Now, sometimes you might want to resequence your lines of lettering so that a, the first line stitches from left to right, and then the second line will stitch from right to left, and then it will alternate through your sequence of words. And if you do that, what you'll need to do is change the stitch order. So you can select your phrase, and you click on Break Apart, which is in the Edit Toolbox. You'll only have to break apart um, like you'll, you'll break apart the phrase, and then you will also break apart the every other line of lettering where you need to change the sequence of letters. So for this first word alignment, it would be kept as just one solid word. For of, you would break that apart, and then you would select the F and then the O, so it re would reverse the stitch order. Then you can select the word words, and it would stitch from left to right. So every other word is going to be resequenced. And you'll do this by sequence, sequence by select. So I would select the word alignment, hold down the control key, select the F and then the O, and then I would select the words, words, and it would stitch from left to right. So every other line would have to be further broken apart so you could select the individual letters. And then after you've finished holding down the control key, click on sequence by selects in color film. And that way, you can see in this first example, the first word ends here and then goes to the front of the word to stitch out. In this second example, the word ends and then it goes to the first letter and will stitch backwards. So that's a way to resequence letters to so that you are not having long jump stitches. Now, in the days when we didn't have machines that cut jump stitches, it was really a lot uh, more practical to do this this way. So your, your jump stitches would be shorter. Now that we have trimmed uh, machines that trim, it isn't as absolutely essential. You can also change the baseline in your lettering uh, object properties and you pre-select this in object properties and there are all these different baselines and again the mastery goes over how to do these different baselines so I'm not going to cover that in the lesson today and then using characters when you click on that select character that will open up a dialog box and you can select a lot of special characters to add to your lettering 
one of the handouts that you have is on editing true type fonts and there are different tools that you may need to access in order to edit these true type fonts so that they stitch well when they are embroidered and one of these tools is in the break apart uh, is break apart and this is in the edit toolbox and what break apart does is it separates the word into individual letters so that you can more easily edit the individual letters then we also have reshape this is in your transform toolbar and when you select reshape and click on the outline of the letter it gives you access to stitch uh, stitch angles and you can change those stitch angles to make the word look better you can also add the stitch angles and sometimes that's necessary in order for you to get the letter particular letter to stitch out correctly if you get this error message when you try to add a stitch angle this is a clue that you're going to have to use an additional tool called the knife tool and the knife is also in the edit toolbox just like add stitch angles and with the knife tool you click across the letter to separate it into separate objects and then you can apply um, different stitch angles there is also a handout on downloading fonts and this is to create multiple outline lettering and i have already downloaded my font and put it in my software but i did want to go over the steps before i go live in the software so the one of my favorite font size is defont.com that you see here in the bar at the top and if you'll just go to defont.com and type in the word prisma in the search box then click on search that will bring you to the font that was used in this lesson click on download now when you click on download this will go to your download folder and you'll open the download folder through windows explorer select the zipped file and then right click on that file so you select it first with a left click then right click and select extract all a dialog box will appear and you want to extract you can extract that to the download folder just by clicking on extract or if you want to take it to a different location click on browse and then you can navigate to where you want to save this on your computer after you get the font downloaded you need to install the font and you need to have the software closed in order to install the font you'll navigate to wherever you save the file and you'll again left click to select that file and then right click and select install for all users now you need to do this and follow this method in order to get it accurate, accurately installed in Corel. Then you're able to open the software and it will be installed and it will be listed both as a true type font as well as in Corel. There are also two handouts on creating lettering and we're going to do outline lettering where we'll use outlines and offsets in the edit toolbox and then we're going to use single outline lettering now with single outline lettering we don't really have a lot of alphabet choices for single outline lettering and a lot of times this is nice to use so we are going to manually digitize this but i wanted to explain that you can digitize this with the open object tool in segments and then select all those segments and apply blackwork run when you apply that blackwork run the software eliminates any jump stitches in the lettering that you've created with the outline stitch however you don't have as much control as when you manually digitize now for some of you just beginning the manual digitizing of lettering may be overwhelming so just listen to that part of the lesson and realize down the road you will be able to do that 
one of the things that is important when you digitize single outline lettering is that you plan your path because when you're not using or relying on black work run to eliminate jump stitches you have to plan your path to insert travel stitches so one of the things i would suggest is that you just trace over that letter and do it as if you're writing this script lettering and when wherever you have to backtrack and you see right in this area i have to backtrack that small arrow represents a travel stitch that will travel up to the top of this um, end of the letter h and then this stitch will be digitized down so again there's a backtrack here so we'll have to insert a travel stitch and then we can go around the letter and come up and then come down here's another backtrack and there's another down and up so it will help if you actually print a template of the lettering and then you can take a marker and add the marker to help you figure out where the lines will backtrack. Now, if you want to change the baseline of this style of lettering, because this isn't really lettering, so you, there's no access to baseline, what you have to do is when you choose your regular filled lettering to serve as a backdrop, and this blue happy holidays that you see is only a backdrop for us to create our uh, outline design. So it's not really lettering, it's an, a design, but this is one way to change the baseline and then just add your single outline on top of that. So you could go around the neckline, for example, of a shirt. So let's go ahead and work in the software and we'll come back to the PowerPoint in a bit, but I'm gonna start out with editing true type fonts. So we've got a new blank design. I'm going to right click on the lettering icon and that opens up object properties. And I'm going to type in the word freehand. And for this first one, I'm gonna choose a font called cursive. So I begin typing in the word cursive and I can press enter and that selects the font. We'll just use this size of lettering. I'm gonna click okay and then click on screen. And while that's selected, I'm gonna change the color so you can see it a little bit better. Now this is embroidered lettering and you can see that the satin stitches are very smooth. The angles look good. Let's compare it to something that is created with a true type font. Another way to open up the object properties is to press the A on the keyboard and that opens up your object properties for lettering. And I'll again type in freehand, but this time I, I'm gonna um, select a true type font and I'm gonna select a script. And when I click on the drop down arrow after doing that, I only see script tr uh, true type fonts. And we're going to choose this freehand 521. And I'll click on OK and then click on screen. And again, I'm going to change the color so that you can see. And when we look at the difference between the embroidery font here in the, the H and the A, you can kind of see, and even the N needs to be edited as well. So you can see that there are some angles that are um, a little bit weird. And so in order to change this, I first need to go to the edit toolbox and select break apart. And I'm also going to change to design view. So when I select just that one letter, that's all I'm selecting. I'll go to reshape and then click on the outline of the design. And I have all these control points and stitch angles. The stitch angles are in between these peach squares. And if I want to change a stitch angle, I can change either end and I can manipulate these. I can also 
add stitch angles. So as I'm moving these, you can see the stitches are changing. Let's go back to um, artistic view. T on the keyboard is a shortcut for artistic view. And that really doesn't look too bad here. It's a lot better than it was. I'll go back to design view and press escape. And let's look at the letter A. Now here, when I go into reshape and click on the outline to add stitch angles, I've got this one long, long angle that you see here. And if I change it, you can see some weird things happen. So I'm gonna undo that. And what I want to do is actually split this letter. So in order to change this angle, I'm going to have to use the knife tool. To use the knife tool, I'll select the letter, then go to the edit toolbox and select the knife. Now, when I do two clicks, and those are two left clicks across that segment and press enter, it is splitting those. So I can change the stitch angle of this one part. And then I'll press the tab key to go to my other letter. And you can see that now I can move those angles and get them so that they look a lot better. Now here, I need to add some stitch angles here. So to do that, I'll go to back to the edit toolbox and select add stitch angles and I can click across the end of the letter and press enter. Let's check it out by going to artistic view and you can see it does look a lot better than it did and the end is going to be changed pretty much the same way. So that is all covered in your editing true type handout. I'll go ahead and close that and we'll get a new design and we'll now cover the multiple outline lettering handout. And I have already installed my font. The font uh, installation instructions are on the handout and I'm, I'll switch to Artwork Canvas to do this. Once I get to Artwork Canvas, I'm going to select the vector lettering and I can click on the drop down arrow and I can type in the word Prisma and it will show that font. I want to place a check mark in front of artistic text and go OK. I'll click on the screen and type in the word Noel. I'm going to increase the size of this until it is about 1.25 in height. You can either increase it visually or you can, of course, use the uh, amounts in the property bar. Now, uh, with this, it needs, right now it's vector lettering, and in order to use the magic wand center line, it needs to be a bitmap. That's a difference in the two types of picture uh, files that there are. The uh, magic wand center line will not work with vector lettering. It has to be bitmap lettering. So I'll go up to bitmaps and convert this to a bitmap and click OK. And now I can go over to Embroidery Canvas. And with the lettering selected, I'm going to go to the Auto Digitize Toolbox and scroll till I find Magic Wand Centerline. Now Magic Wand Centerline puts a single outline in the dark, or well, in the areas where I click. So when I select that and click on the lettering, I, I'm just going to process this by clicking OK. And then it's important that you zoom in so you can accurately place your clicks. And I'm clicking on each part of the black outline. And that adds stitches to any connected areas. 
So you can see when I click on this area, it adds stitches on all the connected areas. And then I'll repeat that for the last letter. And let's hide our bitmap. And here you have your finished lettering. Now there will be jump stitches in this because all the, the individual lines do not connect. And if we watch this stitch out, I'll speed it up here. You can see that the software has decided how to stitch it out. And the software does the stitching by uh, without as many jump stitches by stitching over most of the lines twice. So when you use Magic Wand center line, it's not only giving you an outline stitch, but it's also figuring out a way to decrease your jump stitches. So that is all in the handout called Downloading a Font. Next, we'll do outline lettering. I need to select a new blank design. This, I will also go to Artwork Canvas to do this style of lettering. And I'll select my font and I want to do a thick font here. And the one that I use is Baja's. If you don't have that on your computer, just look for just look for a thick font. Then I'm going to type the word joy. And again, I will visually enlarge the letters and I want these to be about two inches tall. Now if you want to resize them using the property bar, make sure you select lock ratio and then I can enter two inches and it will enlarge the letters so that they're exactly two inches. Now in order to get this so that I'm going to have to move this just for a minute in order to see my uh, color palette. With the lettering selected, and I'll select, select the pick tool, I need to click on the no color icon that removes the fill color from the uh, word. And then I'm going to right click on a color chip to add an outline around. And I only want to have that outline around the letters. Then I'll click on Convert Artwork to Embroidery. And this takes that vector lettering and converts it into a single line of stitch. Now, I also want to measure the width across my lettering. This is going to help me decide how many um, outlines to add within the letter. To activate the measuring tool, I can press M on the keyboard. And then I do want to be in metric for this because it's going to be uh, a little bit easier to add those outlines. And I'll click on one side of the letter and drag across. So it is a, almost 15 millimeters. So I'm going to press escape twice to get rid of the measuring tool and then draw a bounding box in order to select the letters. I'll go to the Edit Toolbox and select Outlines and Offsets. Now here is why we did some calculating. These are going to be offset outlines, and I do want them inside the lettering. So I'm going to swipe across that value, and I'm going to put them at a 2 millimeter spacing. So in order to kind of get a starting point for the offset count, I'm going to take that 15 millimeters and divide it by two. So I've got about a seven and a half, and, but I have also two sides. So I need to divide it again by two. So somewhere between three and four as an offset count would be the way I need to go. I'm going to swipe across that and let's go ahead and try four. I want a, I can do a single stitch. I can do a triple stitch. 
So let's go ahead and um, let's just keep it a single. And I'll select the same color that's in the design. And um, that red is actually toward the very end. You can see the color number over here is 57. So if you scroll to the very end, you'll find that color. And then I'll click OK. And you can see that the outlines are added. Now, four might have been a little bit too many, especially for the Y. So I, these are all independent. I can select that. I can delete it. And that looks a little bit better. So this file then is ready to save. And this is outlined lettering. So I'll go ahead and close that down. And onto our last handout, which is single outline lettering. Again, I'll get a new blank design. I'll go to the digitize toolbox. I'm going to right click on the lettering icon that opens up object properties. And I'm going to type in happy. I'll press enter to go to a new line and then holidays. Now I've got true type font selected. I do want to use a script. And I am going to use that same freehand script. If you don't have that script, you can choose another option. Uh, I'm going to change this to one inch. And remember, if you're in metric, all you have to do is to add the inch symbol after you enter the value. And the software will calculate that amount for you. And I'll click OK and click on screen. Now, you can see that there are some angles that need to be corrected, but when I'm using this as a backdrop for creating lettering on top of it, I don't have to worry about that. I do want to make it so that I can't accidentally select this, so I'm going to right click and select lock. That way, I won't accidentally move those letters. So this is just serving as an image for me to digitize on top of this letter, an outlined letter. So let's first choose our tools. I'm going to use the open object tool, and I'm going to use a triple outline. And here is, again, is where you need to think about, <coughs> pardon me, if you are going to be writing this font where you would have to go up and then backtrack because whenever you have to backtrack over a letter, you're going to have to create a travel stitch and then travel back down. But for this first part of the age, we can begin clicking. And I want to try to put my clicks in the center of the satin outline. I'll use right clicks to form curves and left clicks to form points and I'll come I can come across here and then I want to end this here in the middle of the second post of the letter H. I'll click and then press enter. I did forget to change the color. You do want a contrast color. It just makes it easier to select and easier to see. So now is when I'm going to have to travel up and travel back. So I'm going to have to travel with a single outline. I'll create that with the open object tool. I'll create, uh, I'll select the single outline and I am going to select my color. I'll remember to change it this time. And then I want to zoom in. So I start right where I ended and I'm going to travel up the base of this letter and press enter. Now I'll press escape because I need to go to the edit toolbox and select something called double run. Now this is kind of like copy and paste, but what the advantage of using double run is that it reverses the start and stop points so that in this segment, it's starting here, stopping here. But when I apply double run, 
it's going to start here and stop here. So you'll want to use double run instead of copy and paste. Now, while this double run is selected, I'm going to click on my triple outline stitch, and that covers up that single outline travel stitch. Now I'll go back to my digitize toolbox. I'm going to choose the open object, and now I don't have to backtrack over this. So I can come up and come all the way over here. Oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna to have to backtrack here. So I'm gonna to have to end this right here at this letter because I have to come up and then backtrack. So I'll use the open object tool and the triple stitch for areas where I don't have to backtrack. Again, you wanna make sure that you're click where you left off and I'm going to come around here and again in the middle of the letter click and press enter and that was done with a triple stitch now I have to travel up and back so I have to add that travel stitch so I'll go to the open object I've got my single outline now and I'm going to, again, start where I left off and insert that travel stitch. Again, going to the middle of the next segment of letter. I'll press enter, and now it's time to activate that double run. I'll press escape, I'll select this, and so that you don't need to constantly go back to your edit toolbox, there is a shortcut key and that's control B as in boy. That way you don't have to, you could just use that control B and it will add that double run. I'm going to change it to a triple stitch and now I'm ending back here. So this part, I can come up here, connect with this, travel down and then stop here where the, the P starts. So I'll choose my open object. I can use my tri triple stitch, start where I left off. I'll do a left click here, and then I'm going to come down to the middle of the P, click and press enter. Now I have to go up and back again. So I'm gonna travel up. I'll use my open object tool with a single outline. I'll travel up, press enter, press escape, select, control B, change it to a triple, then so reselect the open object. I've got a single stitch to travel down, press enter, press escape, select the segment, then do control B, change it to a triple, and now I'm ready to go around the P. So here I can use the open object with a triple because I don't have to backtrack. I'll travel around till I'm going to have to go in and then out, so I'll press enter at that point select a single stitch, come back here, press enter, press escape, select the line, control B, change it to a triple outline, and then I can travel to the beginning of the next P with a triple stitch because I do not have to backtrack. I'll use the open object tool to do that and press enter. Now what I want to do is hide my backdrop and I'm going to draw a bounding box around my P, but I want to get it so that I make sure all of these objects are encompassed. There's no sense recreating this. You can copy and you can paste it and you can move it. If you wanted to do any kind of reshaping, you should do the reshaping before you make a copy, obviously. Otherwise, you're going to have to reshape 
twice. And then I'm just using my arrow key to move that over. And I can also unhide my backdrop to make sure I've got it rel uh, placed relatively in the same place. And now I'm ready to do the Y. I'm gonna have to backtrack at the beginning. So I'll go to my open object tool, select the single outline. And actually what I wanna do is, I wanna reshape this point to bring it up a little more. And then I will select, reselect the open object. I've got my single outline. I'll travel up the Y, press enter, press escape, select, and then do control V, change it to a triple. And now I can go around the rest of this. And if I, I can create a backdrop or I can choose not, uh, or back, uh, back stitching here, or I can travel up kind of like we did for the letter A. So travel up and back down. And so that's what I'm going to do for this. So I'll be able to do the open freehand, the triple, and I'll begin stitching or begin clicking. And then I'll do a left click here. And then I'm going to come down. And instead of making that loop, I'm going to make an open loop. You, this is um, the lettering behind there is only a back drop you can come out as far as you want you don't have to follow the letter exactly i'm going to press enter and that's how you create the word so for holidays you could copy the h you would have to digitize the o the l you could create a loop in like we did the y do the i save the dotted line for the end the D you would have to do, the A you could use, uh, you could copy the A up here and um, put it in place when you're ready to do the A. Likewise, you can copy the Y and place it and then you would digitize the S. Now um, for the dotted on the I, I use the ellipse tool and a single outline and just created an open dot and that I did after I finished the S. So the handout gives you all the information about how to do this design. One thing I want to do is show you, I'm gonna hide the backdrop. And um, actually, let me delete this too. And if I change to uh, des design view, and you remember you can use the T on the keyboard or your show artistic view. You want to look for the triangles and the circles because those show you jump stitches. Now this one at the very beginning was caused by uh, the start and stop point. So I'm gonna click on reshape and I'm gonna move the start point so that it starts there and comes around and stops here. Now this one is probably due to just me needing to move, but if I select this line and I've got my start point here my and by moving that start point down you can see how it took care of that tie in and tie off so your goal is just to have one tie off at the end of the letter or at the end of the word excuse me and then your holidays would have uh, i did break between my o and l let me unhide this so I, I did digitize a break. So I did have a tie in and tie off here between the O and the L because there was no really smooth way to get over to the L. And then of course you'll have one for the dot that uh, after the I. So your goal is to minimize the number of tie ins and tie offs. That way it's going to be easier for you to stitch on your card. And that's what, I did with this 
I stitched um, on a card, a greeting card. OESD Embroidery Online has two sizes of cards that are great weight to use for embroidery. And you would create a placement line with the rectangle tool, make sure it's a contrast color, use a single outline. You draw a box around your completed lettering, then press escape, select the rectangle and change the size uh, to be the size of your card. And the last thing you do is move the placement line to start to the start. And I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. You'll hoop your tear away stabilizer in the hoop that you need to use, the size of hoop, stitch the placement line, and then place the card over the placement line. The tape that you see here is embroidery tape tear away. It's also a product by OESD and the design was stitched. And then you remove the card from the stabilizer, cut decorative scrapbook paper for it the inside of the card, and then you can use double-sided tape or tacky glue to attach the decorative paper. So let's pretend that I have this all done. What I'm going to do is select the rectangle tool, a single outline, and I'm just going to drag a box around my card or around my letter. I want to select that and change it to a contrast color. And I would need to look at my dimensions on the card that I chose. Probably want to be on um, US measurement system for this. I want to unlock proportions and then change the width and the height to the size that's printed on whatever card stock you use. The last thing to do is select the placement line and click on move to start. So the placement line will stitch. Um, this, of course, uh, your blue is going to be deleted eventually uh, and it won't let you delete it until you unlock it and I can delete this and then I have my happy holidays remaining. So that is pretty much how you create some uh, lettering in different ways and this is outline lettering and Julie I'm ready for questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Debbie. The first question, I'll go back to the beginning here. I just added my grandson's name in capital letters to a project, and the first five letters came out perfectly, but the white bobbin thread came to the surface with the letter N. Do you know what might be going on here? Um no but sometimes things like that can happen if they're maybe the needle needed to be replaced at that point um, i'm not sure what kind of machine you were using but sometimes the uh, tension may need uh, adjusting uh, for your machine it's uh yeah. the end was the actually the very last letter in the name so something must have happened at the end right right yeah just... but i would just i would just make sure always oil your machine at the beginning of a project that can really help us uh, especially if you're having problems and and make sure that you use a new needle if you can and there could be something that uh, maybe a slight jam that occurred. It's, it's hard to say unless um, you know all those specifics about the needle. And I don't know what kind of fabric she was working on. So okay, that's when you take a magic marker or a Sharpie, <laughs> the color of your thread, and you color in that bobbin thread. And uh, that kind of hides it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, next question. Does it matter if the font is true type or open font? I've been installing open font or OTF. And our software will work with both. And, um, but I don't know that there is a preference. They both will give you the same kind of headaches that you're going to have to, um, <laughs> you're going to have to edit the especially if you use satin stitch text 
you're going to have to do some editing. Okay. And what do you recommend for quilt labels if I want to do something, a uh, font that's very small? Okay. If you go to the help menu and reference manual and open the reference manual, go to appendices and open that and go to embroidered fonts. You'll anywhere there is a red uh, word in your reference manual, that means it's a link. So I can go to small fonts and that will take me to the list of fonts that can be 0.2 inches or four millimeters tall. Um, also further up, you have the run fonts and these are workable as well uh, for small lettering. You can do 0.2 inches again, and these are five millimeters suggested height. So these are the fonts that I would go to for quilt labels. All right, awesome. Wondering why you're using the single outline and then changing to the triple. Can you the, I only use the single outline when I was digitizing the travel stitch. So when I, I have a lot of um, things open there. Okay, so with, whenever you're, you're digitizing where you don't have to backtrack over a letter. Like this part is gonna be the triple. But then when I'm doing a double row, so remember we, we digitized up and then back over. So the, the segment that I digitized that went up the letter was the single stitch. And then when I apply double run and stitch back down, that's when I use the triple stitch. So the triple stitch was covering up that single stitch. The only purpose of the single stitch is to get up the letter and then that places it so you can go back down the letter. Okay. What is the name of the website that had the Prisma font? Uh, the Prisma font is dafont, D-A-F-O-N-T dot com. And that is in your handout. If you um, look at your handout, it gives you the web address. All right, let's see if I have a couple more questions here. Could you please explain the placement line in color film? Okay, this placement line is actually an outline that stitches, and let me bring up my PowerPoint again. So the placement line is just gonna stitch, and it's just an outline of the, that is made the size of the card that you're gonna be stitching on. So that's stitched only on the stabilizer. And then that way you can accurately place your card along those placement lines and then you tape it in place and you can do your stitching. So you would look at, in, for those sizes, if for example, this one is five and an eighth by seven, let's use this one. So I would, once I get this, I wanna do um, seven, and I said five and an eighth, I think, so 5.125 <laughs> and press enter. And then I can place my words within that card and I know that the words are gonna fit the way I want them to on the card. I can also take, after I get my words done, I can insert an embroidery design that is um, a more open design and add that to the card as well. Okay, awesome. And one last question, what is the difference between a jump stitch and a travel stitch? Okay, um, right here, you see these stitches that are on the screen. And this is jumping from the end of the placement line to the beginning of the lettering. So that's a jump stitch. It will be trimmed um, on most of our current machines do have a trimming function. If you have an older machine, 
because there is a color stop here, you would trim after the machine jumps to the beginning of the lettering. Now a travel stitch, uh, my travel stitch is hidden, but let me um, open up show objects. And this was the travel stitch that was purposely digitized from the point I stopped up to where I needed to begin the letter again. So a travel stitch will actually form stitches. It's not going to jump up there and create a tie-in and tie-off. So the travel stitch that was inserted takes care of any kind of jumps. If I delete that, you see it's creating a jump stitch. Now I'm going to undo that to bring that back. So I travel up here so then I can travel down without having a jump stitch. And you don't want a lot of jump stitches in any kind of design if you can avoid it. And professionally digitized designs use travel stitches all the time to go from one area of a design to the next area. Tie-ins and tie-offs take time. They add to your uh, time to stitch out a design. Plus, especially if you're working with cards, you don't want a bunch of tie-ins and tie-offs at all because it can damage the card as you're stitching into paper. Okay, good to know. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. Thank and you, Julie. Thank you everyone for attending. The webinar and the handouts will be available for you on Bermina.com. Go under the Learn and Create tab. I'll give us a couple days to get that uploaded for you. Um, also, while you're on the website, make sure to sign up for our newsletter. This way you will get the emails about everything that's going on at Bermina. Um, and also check out wealso.com. That is Bermina's creative sewing blog. And there's a lot of great information and tutorials there for you. So uh, thanks again, Debbie, and I hope everybody has a great evening. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.